we are live and I just gave myself a little light. All right, everybody warmly welcome to this uh, amazing uh, cocktails and courageous conversation where two people get together in a bar and have a drink or a cup of tea or whatever we want to have and have a conversation. And I was just talking to Hank Rob about that, like we are we do this at conferences, right? We meet, we meet in the bar and you you actually said that you you have had practice even before getting into the ACBS. Even before <laughs> ACBS, I talk to people in bars. I, I what can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> and you are such a like I'm, I've tried to so you're not inside the group that we are in right now. And people, if you are watching us, make sure to tell us where are you watching from? How are you doing so that we can interact with you? And please make sure to ask any questions you might have I'll be monitoring the comments. But um, I have been talking about you, Hank, uh, and showing pictures. I've showed the reel for when you were dancing. Uh, I think it was your daughter who, who filmed you. Yeah. Uh, and I put a picture of you inside the group and refer to you as PhD and badass. So um, you're, you're, you have such a special place in my heart because we often connect the conferences and I have the best memories from you at the dance floor with your tie around your head. Uh, going absolutely bananas and I love it. So it's such a pleasure to have you here. And I'm so I'm so thrilled to to show you. <laughs> I can't even, I don't know if that's if that comes out right, but you know, to to put you in front of all these lovely people and to um so that you can receive the love from everybody. And so we're gonna talk about your book and we're gonna talk about all the things that we promised to talk about. And before we do that if anybody out there should not know you, uh, would you be willing to give a little introduction? Like, who is Hank Rob? How would you describe yourself? Oh, that's a big question. Well, I get. Um, we'll have a little geography. Uh, yes. I grew up in Texas in a city there called Dallas in the United States. Uh, I was uh, one of those kids that... Uh, parents sent off somewhere to co to uh, camp, and the United States is a big place. So uh, I went away to uh, Colorado and to the upper Midwest and Wisconsin and Minnesota. So I got to see some of the country that way. Uh, I went off to college in Missouri. Uh, I had met uh, a woman in high school, and my parents were afraid that bad things would happen if we were uh, in the same college together. So I went <laughs> uh, many states away, uh, graduated from there, uh, married her, and spent four years in the U.S. Navy, uh, wow. mostly on either coast of the United States. Uh, my only trip to the East Coast was for a year. I've never been uh, east of the Mississippi except for that one year. And uh, spent a lot of time in California. Went to graduate school at the University of Nebraska, right in the middle of the country. And uh, then uh, an internship in the Bay Area. I worked for um, eight years at a small college in northern Idaho near the com Canadian border. And then my wife thought that was the end of the earth. And I kept saying, no, no, it's it's about 60 miles further over there. We're close, but it's not the end of the earth yet. So in 1986, we moved to Portland, Oregon, where I have been uh, working uh, in private practice in a suburb. And our two daughters were raised here. One was born in Idaho. She was about six when we came here. and. Uh, the other uh, was born and raised here. And uh, I got involved in, uh, I met Steve Hayes at uh, a conference. And, um, oh, I'll tell this story because I think it makes me look smart. Uh, <laughs> I, said to, I said to Steve after the first time I heard him speak, I said, uh, you seem to be one of the few people who can tell the difference between radical behaviorism and methodological behaviorism. And he said, you're one of the few people who have noticed. So after that, <laughs> we kept meeting up at conferences 
And for about 10 years, I tried to explain to Steve why he was wrong. And then after 10 years, I decided, well, he's got a lot of things that are right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I uh, went to the uh, first Reno conference. Actually, uh, I was fortunate enough, I hope this isn't too much background. My, my training background came through rational emotive behavior therapy. Mm-hmm. And uh, Steve had a conference uh, called Acceptance and Change. In fact, the papers appeared in a book in about uh, 93. And uh, he invited Al Ellis, and Al knew that I was very interested in acceptance. So he said, would you have a look at this paper I'm submitting and give me your thoughts? And I said to him, uh, of course, this was all via mail. There wasn't any even email then. Uh, I said to him, well, I can do better than that. I can really add some things and you can make me the second author. And he was kind enough to do that uh, because he was often generous. And then um, Al got ill at the time of the conference. And so I went and that and I went early, which meant I got to go into the archives of all the tapes of comprehensive distancing, which is what act was being called then. So I had an opportunity to see very early, not just what people say about goes on in a uh, conference room, in a consulting room, uh, with people doing uh, this psychological flexibility in its early mode, but actually seeing what people do. And I think that's where you really find out what's going on. That's the real value of, of either sitting in on sessions or, or now we have uh, not only audio but videotapes and they had videotapes. So I think if you see what people are actually doing, then you find out in a way that you really never find out just talking about it. And so, Hank, what are you doing today? Like, uh, so I know that you're PhD and badass, uh, ACBS peer review trainer, fellow of the ACBS. There, like, the description is very, very long. What is what? Do, what does your everyday look like today? Well, um, I cut back on the number of clients that I have, so I have a small uh, practice. And uh, there are lots of things that I'm uh, interested in. And uh, anyone who has much time with ACBS knows that they are likely to find me on the listserv saying something about something. Yes. Um, And I'm also uh, very interested in politics and uh, in social uh, activities. So uh, not not just good times, although I am very interested in good times, <laughs> but um, uh, also if you know much about uh, what's happening in the United States, uh, you know that if you're interested in politics, there's a lot of things to keep your eyeballs fixed on. Mm. Uh, as I was indicating, uh, uh, my it's just my wife and I together now, our children have left, and... Um, Uh, The great thing about uh, this time of the world is that I can interact with people all over the planet. And so uh, as I'm able to do now. So it's really uh, something that I enjoy doing. Um, It was one of the wonderful things about ACBS. Well, how many people in the world are interested in this? Well, not very many compared to the number of people in the world. But because of technology, I have a chance to communicate with those people no matter where they are. And yeah. I very much enjoy doing that. We enjoy and- having you here. I just want to just wanted to tell you that we have uh, Johanna from Lulio in Sweden saying hello to you. The ever so lovely Ulrika saying hello. She's in Sweden in Malmo. Uh, Anne is watching it from France, Lyon, lovely to see you. Um, and we have several people here uh, just being here with us and, and cheering on you and and us. <laughs> well, the, the uh, climate or the weather here seems to uh, want to uh, 
make me feel at home with yeah. you and a friend from Sweden because we had more snow last night. Not a common experience here, but everything is covered in white. I know. And two nights of fishing. So well, hopefully, uh, because I am, that's the other thing I do. I'm a fishing nut. And uh, so hopefully it'll be melted by next week and I won't be tromping around in the snow in order to dunk my line in the water. <laughs> I love that. You sent me the video yesterday of the of the snow and you know, I felt very connected to you there. Although there's not a lot of snow where we are in Sweden right now. Oh. I wanted to show people this one. I have this little baby here uh, and willingly act for spirit, spiritual development. So, and you said like when, when we talked about like, what do you want to talk about? And you wrote a lot, you, you wrote stuff and you said, this might sound like academic gooey. <laughs> So yeah. tell us about tell us about your book, uh, and 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 you know we're not Stephen Hayes, so we don't not all of us speak Hayes. So, <laughs> and you know I love and adore Steve, but and and so tell us about your book. Why what what made you write? Like why did you write this book? Why is this book important? Well, for for one thing, way back in my history. Uh, I was interested in the intersection between psychological services and um, religious beliefs and practices. Because I, I entered uh, the practice of psychology at the time that cognitive behavioral psychology as a general field uh, was happening, um, I was uh, drawn to uh, Al Ellis. And one of the things about cognitive behavior therapy is that you often have to teach people a way of viewing the world that is more helpful to them. Hmm. Well, many people enter uh, the consultation room with religious beliefs and practices already in place. And if you could use those to actually be helpful instead of unhelpful, um, then you wouldn't have to teach them because they would already know what you were talking about. So um, uh, way back in 86, I had a panel uh, at uh, American Association of uh, uh, APA, the American Psychological Association, on uh, religion and uh, psychological services. So I've been interested in this for a long time. And uh, the American Psychological Association has a division of it that used to be called the, the division of the psychology of religion. Mm -hmm. And then they had a big fight for about 10 years uh, to rename it the division of psychology of religion and spirituality. Hmm. And so I have been interested in the spiritual aspect of people that doesn't have anything to do necessarily with religion for a very long time. And I came in that way, as I explained, uh, people come with religious beliefs and practices. They already have these ways of thinking. You don't have to teach them. You can make use of what they already have. But now uh, I'm interested, and I, as some people may know, Steve Hayes's first paper was making sense of spirituality. Now there hasn't, <laughs> there are not that many people who have followed up with the word spirituality. We have this this thing, self as context, which you're going to right away have to start explaining to people who have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. But at least where I am, uh, people are aware of this little division of uh, body, mind, and spirit. Hmm. And uh, while, uh, well, we can start talking. The first thing I said was monistic. Hmm. Well, monism is, is one kind of stuff. And you can get an idea about this if you're familiar with uh, a fellow named Rene Descartes. Most people who've hung around psychology stuff, they get that name. And uh, even in the general uh, uh, 
the public. There's a book out, uh, Descartes' Mistake, I think, that talks about how life has gone wrong. But the thing that's important here is that he is yet another and a good example of this dualist idea that there's two kinds of stuff in the world. And uh, Descartes said, yeah, there's two kinds of stuff. One kind of stuff is physical, and physical stuff has, uh, takes up space, and it has weight, and it endures in time. And there is this other kind of stuff that uh, doesn't take up any space and has no weight and uh, endures forever. And so actually these two kinds of stuff interact. Now, why it was important that uh, in the history of thought and science for Descartes to have said what he did was he said, uh, this famous phrase of the mind comes before the matter. And why that was important, uh, as far as we know, Descartes was a devout Catholic. He wasn't really making this up. But functionally, he said, you church people, you have the most important part, this spaceless, weightless, timeless stuff. It's the first thing. It's the premier thing. And then there's this other body, physical stuff. So that's pretty much secondary. Why don't you leave us alone to study it since it's secondary and really not that important? And uh, the bargain worked. Uh, People uh, who were in uh, Roman Catholic countries could study bodily functions, uh, study how the circulation of blood works and so on, because Descartes was interested in that, and uh, not run afoul of the church. Well, this was a great deal until this uh, German, Wilhelm Wundt, showed up in the uh, 1870s and or 19, 1870s and 80s, and he said, well, there's two kinds of stuff. We're not going to argue about that. But the principles of science could be applied to the second kind of stuff. Well, I'm going a step further. I just want one kind of stuff. So if we're going to talk about spirituality, we're going to put it in the context not of two kinds of stuff, but just one kind of stuff. Now, pragmatic. Um, oh, so the thing about that, if you hang around ACT, is you'll hear this uh, word deontological. Well, ontological, ontology, is the study of the nature of stuff. <laughs> and so... Um, like Descartes was telling us, well, some stuff is spaceless, weightless, and timeless, and other stuff takes up space, has weight, and exists in time. Uh, rather than discuss any of that, we're just going to leave that alone. There's one kind of stuff. We're not going to try to discuss its nature, but we are going to talk about a particular kind of truth, and that is not a correspondence kind of truth not there's a real world and we try to make our words be uh, names of what's going on in the real world and if our names match the real world then we have truth the alternative one alternative the one that acbs adopts the uh, contextual behavioral science adopts and that i want to adopt is no um organisms, including the human organisms, they're up to things. And if they are successful with their behavior in achieving what they are up to, that's what truth is. Hmm. So that's all the commentary about successful working. Hmm. So one kind of stuff, we're not going to talk about the nature of the stuff, and we're going to talk about truth as uh, things work 
for the purposes you have in view. Now that'll bring us up. Tell me when. Tell me when the next question should arise. <laughs> <laughs> that so, does bring us up to. That does bring us up to. Well, what kind of thing are you up to? Hmm. And if you haven't noticed, we don't die immediately or quickly. We keep living. So it's useful to be focused on what we want to be up to with our life, not for the next five minutes. Hmm. And this is why wisdom, I think, is really the right metaphor for what we're up to. Uh, we've been led to believe that health is the right metaphor, but that does not seem right to me at all. Uh, it seems to me the right metaphor is wisdom. Mm -hmm. What will we be glad later that we did now? Mm. So you might say there's a big picture of your life and a little picture of the moment. Yeah. And the thing is, to act in the little picture of the moment in the service of the big picture of your life. And I would maintain you can't really do that from your body, and you can't really do it from your mind, but you can do it from this other place that I would call spirit. Hmm. That makes really good sense. I really like that. And so your book, Hank, who is this for? Like, who is it written for? Is it for practitioners or is it for everybody? I wrote it for everyone. And I yeah. hoped that I used uh, a level of language and a kind of language that most people uh, who got through the eighth grade could make sense of. <laughs> and so... And I wanted, so I, I've read, I haven't read the, full disclosure, I haven't read the entire book yet, and I will. Um, one of the things uh, that, just, so I so I decided to do this. I'm just going to, you know, do like this, and then I'm just going to see where it takes me. And it took okay. me somewhere that really resonates with myself. Um, and so in this book, you're saying, and again, this is maybe completely out of context, because I didn't, I didn't read what came before it. But you talk about that you have given a lot of talks over the years. And once the group that you're speaking to gets large enough, there is a very good chance your alarm system will go off. And then you talk about like what it's like for you to be on large in on a stage in front of larger groups and noticing uh, the alarm system. And so could you could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that will resonate with a lot of us uh, having fear and how spirituality may come into play in a moment like that for you and for others yeah you can um you can notice that you're afraid yeah and if you will do that first thing uh in the title of the book which is to willingly acknowledge now i've i've stopped using the word acceptance because uh where i am Uh, the word accept really turns out to mean approve. So yeah. people say, I can't accept that. Yeah. What they mean is, I don't approve of that. Yes. And uh, if we go with acknowledge, by the way, I owe some English, well, I think they were a native English speaker. I heard them in Dublin. Uh, they were working with organizations, I think, in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And she was the one who pointed out that she wasn't have any, having any luck with uh, uh, acceptance with this group and had gone to acknowledgement. And mm -hmm. I, I think I wish I knew her name because when she pointed it out, I said, oh, my gosh, I got to rewrite this book I've been working on. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, the first thing is to acknowledge, oh, I'm afraid. You know, yeah. my alarm system is going off. Well, now, do I willingly acknowledge it or do I grudgingly acknowledge it? Yeah. When we're talking about acceptance, we're talking about not only acknowledging what is or was or may be, but doing so willingly, not acknowledging it and trying to, oh, it you know, here it is, but it can't be here. 
uh, I learned a little uh, couplet from Al Ellis, demandingness will land me less than what I really want. Yeah. So it must not be here. It must not be here. It must not be here. It's not going to help. So what can I do? I can, uh, first of all, prepare my talks, have them written down. I print them in large print because when I get afraid, I have a harder time focusing uh, and I have dyslexia so I have a hard time with words anyway so I print it in large print uh, I keep a glass of water uh, at hand because my mouth is going to get dry and one of the things that I also know is that if I begin and my voice is quivering and I'm not uh, flowing smoothly if I begin and I keep at it and persist in my present presentation uh, since it's usually longer than those three minutes I got uh, when I was in a public speaking class in high school my body never had time to calm down mm -hmm. but usually when I'm in a, 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 a conference uh, at a presentation I have longer than three minutes so by the end if I just move myself along I have begun to deliver as well as I can. Mm -hmm. So I do things to change the context, to help support me in case I do have trouble. And then I willingly acknowledge that I have the trouble and I choose to proceed anyway. Yeah. I love that. It is very it, it is very act uh, it is it is very act consistent language and I'm I'm glad too that we have more ways of describing acceptance because as you said for many it means approving and or resignating or tolerating or something like that which is a very passive and, and can be very difficult for people and so what does that look like when when you are seeing clients and you are working with this spirituality com which is completely new to me so again full disclosure uh i'm not used to um w like talking about sp uh, spirituality or incorporating spirituality well not intentionally anyway and so what does that look like uh, when in your you know clinical conversations with 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 clients for instance what does that look like well, if you will uh, indulge with me, yes. uh, as I said at the very beginning, uh, the, you can often learn more by seeing what people are doing than having them talk about it. Yes. So, uh, if you notice the chair that you're sitting on, yeah. you may not only be able to notice it, which you said you could do, you might even be able to notice that you're noticing. Hmm. Can you do that second thing? Yeah. Yeah. Now, that's great. If you had said to me, no, I, I can't notice that I'm noticing. I can, I can only notice. I, then I would say that was fine too. Hmm. The thing is, if I asked you, and I will ask you right now, who's doing that? Who is doing the noticing? and the noticing that you're noticing. Well, in your head, maybe in English, but maybe in a different language, mm -hmm. <laughs> you will hear me or I yeah. am. Yeah. I'm doing you know, the noticing. That's exactly, yeah. yeah. And it ought to be quite clear that blah, blah, blah. Well, that's not what's doing it. Hmm. Those words are pointing to an aspect of your being that is doing it. And then if I give you this funny uh, instruction, but I think you can follow it, take yourself to that place. Well, what place? The place from which you can notice and notice that you're noticing. And when you get there, you will recognize well, this isn't my body. 
this isn't my mind with its thoughts and images, not, not my body with its sensations. This is someplace else. Well, we need a name for that place. And as I said, that looks for everybody, not for people who like, oh, so that's yourself as context. Well, who has any idea what that is? Uh, let's try a name that we might be able to all recognize. We have a body, we have a mind, and we have this other aspect of ourselves that seems to me quite accurately described as the spiritual aspect of ourselves. One thing about it is, uh, it's been there a long time. If you go back and, and consider when you were eight or nine or seven years old, you had a very different mind and a very different body. But this aspect of you, unlike your mind and body, has hardly changed at all over the years. And another thing about it, no matter what it notices, it doesn't seem much changed by what it notices. Hmm. In your life, in all of our lives, hopefully, we have had some joy. And I know for sure we've had some sorrow because <laughs> this world is not, if we were on the committee, we would not have a world like this where we want things and then we often don't get them and we don't want things and then we often get those and then we feel sad because that's how that works. Well, who would, you know, put in a, you know, let's make a world like that. <laughs> no, but here we are anyway. And so we experience joy, we experience sorrow, but this aspect of us that notices those things isn't changed by it. Hmm. which makes it a rather different place. Yeah. But makes it an interesting place because it's a place from which you can experience anything without the danger of harming the thing that experiences it. Yeah. Now, you can hurt your mind, you can hurt your body, hmm. but this thing... Um, seems to be somewhat different, which is yeah. why I think it's useful to have a different name for it. Yeah. And then it has some other aspects that I name in the book, and we can talk about them here. But those are a couple of things. Hmm. I hear, I so see that, your name mentioning, that's wait, I'm sorry. I see you mentioned, I'm sorry I interrupted you, Hank. I just wanted to uh, make see make sure like if people have questions, hello from Denmark, there's several people watching us. If you have any questions, just feel free to bring them in here and, and I'll ask Hank. Um, and so um, <laughs> I forgot what I was gonna say. Do, do you know what came into my mind? I was like, if we were in a bar, like literally, because you and I have been in a bar a few times, like an actual bar after work and you would say to me go to that place where you can notice like it would be completely out of context in, in a therapy session or like it would make sense but if you like go to that place where you can notice the noticer uh, I would need another cosmopolitan <laughs> <laughs> that that's why it's that's why it's just fine to go with notice it, exactly place from which you can notice you don't have to notice that you're noticing. Just notice anything. Just notice the thing, anything. The thing that makes it an interesting place, though, is that you can keep going at it. Exactly. So I can notice you noticing. I can notice me noticing you noticing me. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We need a lot of cosmopolitans for that. And I really like this because, again, you know, for many clients, it's it it they are so. Uh, in their experience and they're so entangled with their difficult experiences or with difficult body sensations and when you were talking about this place it felt very soothing and and very uh safe it's the place from which i can observe uh and acknowledge and hopefully willingly acknowledge whatever experiences uh, i'm having oh i remember my question now i saw you writing in the book a few times you wrote way cool is that kind of an acronym or is that something like you're talking about way cool? 
Well, um, um, I, it, you get there by finding things in life that are cool. I really go for this. This is terrific. Yeah. And then uh, things get even cooler. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can kind of get at the, the top of the top of the heap, and it's like way cool. <laughs> and what I suggest is that that is the pursuit yeah. of life. Stuff you really care about. Yeah. Um, I'm very fond of uh, Saint John and Saint Paul. Uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And they wrote, uh, <laughs> there's nothing you can do that can't be done. Now that's mm -hmm. a really important line. And it's important because if you go to this uh, spiritual aspect of your being, then even when your mind tells you you can't do something that you can do, uh, and your body pushes on you uh, about something you can't do, if you're at the spiritual aspect, then you can think, I can't raise my hand, and you can raise it. You can think, I can't, I, uh, I, uh, have, I have to raise my hand, and you cannot raise it. So when I'm giving that talk, if I'm at this place, then no matter what my thoughts and feelings are about my performance, I'm in control of my hands and arms and feet and mouth. Now, mm. maybe not as much as I want to be, because when I'm scared, I may stammer or I may have trouble with my words, but I can talk. I can give the talk. Mm. Uh, what's the rest of that uh, uh, verse? There's nothing you can do that can't be done. Now, when I was in my 20s, I tried about 1,500 times to slam dunk a basketball. I never got, I not, not only never got over the rim, I never got near the rim. And I don't think this was a matter of training. I didn't need another 1,500 times. There are things you can't do, but there anything you can do. Hug somebody, say something nasty. Anything you can do, you can do. And what is required? Well, Lennon and McCartney say all you need is love. Exactly. And what I would say is all you need is something that you actually give a rip about. Yeah. Now, this is a little tricky because much of our lives uh, when we're young are about being told these are the things you should give a rip about. Hmm. And then it might be a nightmare to find that you don't or that you give a rip about something else. There's a wonderful little teaching story from uh, from India that goes like this. Uh, a woman came to a teacher and said, uh, I can't find God, so I can't devote myself because I can't find God. And the teacher said, is there nothing in the world that you care for? And the woman thought a moment and she said, well, I care for my niece. And the teacher said, go and serve her. Find those things that, that for you are way cool hmm. and go serve them. Now, this experience uh, is a little like in the beginning. Now, sometimes <laughs> it just blasts people. <laughs> but often, it starts out as kind of like one instrument playing softly. And you kind of hear it. And uh, if you follow it, it may fade away, because sometimes it's an illusion. And uh, if you tell people uh, in your life about it, uh, very often, if it's not the thing that they think you should be hearing, they will tell you, oh, that's a waste of your time. Pay no attention to that. Uh, how are you going to make a living at that, for goodness sake? And uh, 
uh, you won't pay attention. Uh, in the Christian tradition, there's a saying, uh, be careful of the passing of Jesus. He may not come again. Mm-hmm. So pay attention. Pay attention to what's happening in your mind and your body. You're this something that touches you. And if you pursue it, it can get louder and more instrument and varied genres of music. Some people, it's only one music, but some people, it's a lot of different musics. Now, I'm using this metaphor of music because people will often talk about um, the world will talk to you, but I'm not talking is about meaning. Things mean something. I'm not interested in what means something. I'm interested in what makes your heart sing. What music moves you. When I, uh, I didn't realize that piano tuners, when they come to tune a piano, they bring these tuning forks. And I thought, well, you just hit the tuning fork and then you make the note uh, sound like the tuning fork. But that's not how it works. If you get the note tuned properly, the tuning fork will just go off. It is said to resonate with the note. Now, that's what we're looking for. Something that makes the buzz go off in you. Something you resonate to. And that's what you could choose to make important. That's the second part. Willingly choose with your hands and arms and feet and mouth, not this kind of, oh, I chose to do this, and then who knows what happens. Choosing is something you do with your hands and arms and feet and mouth. And one of the things you can choose is the way you do things. You could choose doing it willingly. And I think most of us have had some chores when we were, well, maybe after we get big too, there are chores. But when we're young, we get these chores and we do them often grudgingly Mm. but sometimes we did them willingly Mm. and just notice the difference yeah well what you do with your hands and arms and feet and mouth not only is that a choice you can do you can make from this spiritual dimension but the way you do them willingly acknowledge willingly choose that's an option too from this place this is just sweet music to me. I like first of all that you're mentioning Paul and <laughs> and and John and that like that this metaphor is just really really resonates with me and I love what you're saying about go after what is way cool, go after the bus, go after what makes your heart sing. Uh, I want to I want to come here and look in the comments and in questions um there are people from Denmark here. Hello from Denmark, from Italy, Sweden, Finland. Uh, hugs to the both of us from Honora. Uh, so, oh. yeah, you know Honora. <laughs> I love that Ricky once told me that accept was the absence of to fight with. So both acknowledgement, surrendering and accept the presence of. And I feel like this is a spiritual perspective in my life now, says uh, our good friend Alex. Um, when I acknowledge me fighting with and struggling, I remember to drop my guard and make room for the things that my nature has picked up as a struggle and leave the fight behind. Well, that's beautiful, Alex Rune. Chris says, I really like the simplistic way you explain spiritual aspects. I guess it, it's also partly what attracts me to act. So, yeah, I agree. Like People really like the way you just explain this to us. Um, and... Let's see what else is here. Hello from Maastricht. I love the topic. The noticing self or notice noticing part of us. It seems that there's also no judgment at all. So it is it is also beyond beyond me, beyond I am, like a video camera just noticing. Does, yes. Do you agree and with that? Say, well, let me say something about fighting. I think yeah. this is a good thing. Because yeah. uh, uh, fighting Uh, pushing for something uh, can be a very good thing. The difference is uh, 
how dare they be doing something different or thinking something different or saying something different than what I agree with? If you're going to be in a fight, uh, well, they're allowed to be as they are. If it wasn't allowed, they wouldn't be doing it. Hmm. So if you're going to be in a fight with someone, recognize they're allowed. They're allowed to be as they are. Just because you think they shouldn't be that way. <laughs> I, there's another good line that I got from Al Ellis, and that is, uh, you may be the center of your universe, but you are not the center of the universe. What? So if you're going... <laughs> <laughs> yes, what? <laughs> what? How could they disagree with me? <laughs> That's not cool. <laughs> how, how could it be? Mm. It be that they are wrong and hang yeah. on to being wrong. Yeah. Well, this is allowed. And yeah. one of the ways that you know that it's allowed is think about the last time you were wrong and hung into hang and hung on to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the thing is that yeah, than... so I think like fighting both both goes for like fighting other people for about being right or whatever, but also I think there's a fight with our inner universe, like fighting with our thoughts and feelings, fighting with our experiences, not wanting them. Yes, and another aspect of this, I think, that I do often find myself saying to clients is, and have you forgiven yourself for that? Mm. Or are you still holding it against you? Yeah. Because uh, we often hold whatever the facts are, if I had a piece of paper, I don't care what I don't care what the what the facts are. You know, you write them all down. These are all the facts, and then you hold them against yourself. Yeah. Well, forgiveness is just not holding the facts against yourself. It's yeah. not that the facts change; it's that your relationship to the facts change. The way and you what hold does it change? them differently. Yeah. Yes, willingly acknowledging. Yeah, this is what happened. Yeah, this is what I think. This is what I feel. This is what yeah. I did. Now what? Am I going to hold that against myself, or am I going to do something that fits with that big picture, the one that uh, let's just talk about it? That I would say is made up of your leading principles and your mm. values. Mm. Now, I think that sometimes in act this gets confused because uh, values tends to get used, the same word gets used for two different things. Uh, the, that's why I talk about leading principles versus values. Uh, if I went north, I had a compass, and the compass pointed me to north and I started out toward north and I kept going and I was sufficiently supplied, eventually I could get to that place on the planet uh, uh, that we call magnetic north and when I got there the compass needle would sort of go limp and every time I walked away from there it would point me right back where I came from. But if I use that compass in either east or west, I'd never get to a place that was east or west. I could just keep going and going and going. Now, I would get to places, and we might call those goals. I achieve a goal, but I never get to east or west. That's how what I call a leading principle. Um, if uh, you want to graduate high school, well, if you put in the seat time, chances are you graduate. The goal is attained. But if you want to be the best educated person you could be, when would you achieve that? Hmm. No matter how well educated you get, you get up the next day and pursue, be the best educated person I can be. If you want to get married, well, usually there's somebody 
So you get married. Now, the, again, the goal has been accomplished. But if you want to be the best mate you can be, when hmm. do you finish that? You keep going and going and going. Yeah. Uh, if you want to have children, you get them the usual way or you adopt them. Uh, again, the goal is attained. But if you want to be the best parent you can be, no matter how old they get, I mean, what they need at two is not what they need at 32. But mm -hmm. if you want to be the best parent you can be, you keep going and going and going. That's mm -hmm. how leading principles work. Mm -hmm. The thing is, you can't go east and west at the same time. But no matter which direction you go, you could choose to go by walking or running or swimming, you have water. So what I want to talk about here is values. No matter what direction I go, I want to do it compassionately, openly, willingly. Hmm. This is why I think willingly is the most important value, the most yeah. important way of being in the world is being there willingly. Well, those two things, the things you pick, that's the other thing about the spiritual dimension, no matter what, if you can pick it, you can pick it. <laughs> Even if the world tells you, no, you can't pick that. Don't you dare pick that. You can pick it. And well, those leading principles and values make up the big picture of your life. You always are acting in the little picture of the moment but you can act in the service of the big picture of your life. Way cool. And I'm noticing, so your book is about acknowledge, choose, and teach others. Would you tell us about like that teaching aspect? I'm just gonna show the book again for people yes. in case they have missed it. Here we go. The value, the value of teaching others, well, first of all, there's never going to be enough people to read that book. <laughs> but if everybody who learned these principles taught them to other people, then there might be enough people doing that, that these principles could get widely distributed. And the value of teaching others is not simply that what you are teaching is transmitted. The value is that people will not understand what you're talking about, the way you understood it. Mm. You might say, you had trouble in the beginning, you misunderstood things, and then you had, oh, I see how it works. Well, they will misunderstand it in a different way. Mm. So you have to open yourself to, gee, they're not getting it. Why aren't they not getting it? Uh, oh, because they see it this way. Oh, well, in that case, I'll have to tell it to them this other way. I'll have to show it to them in a way that works for them. Well, when you do that, you're expanding your own awareness and understanding of the very thing you're trying to transmit. Hmm. So teaching is a very valuable activity for you because in teaching others, you learn more about what it is you're trying to teach. Yeah. True that, true that. There's a question here for you uh, from our very own Ulrike, it's Swedish Ulrike. So would you say there's a difference between, oh, this is a, this is a, this has been hanging on in my head as well. Would you say there's a difference between self as context and what you call spirit? For me, it seems like the same kind of experience of self. I love the way you talk about this, by the way. So what would be your take on that? I know Rika is very well trained in ACT and trains others in ACT. So she speaks fluent ACT language. And is there a difference between what some people would refer to as self as context and this spirit that you are referring to? Yeah, I, I think there's no difference at all. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when Steve wrote that first paper, Making Sense of Spirituality, is exactly what he's talking about. Yeah. Now, you know, we, we invented these so-called mid-level terms. Well, uh, you know, acceptance is not a strange word. Now, I'll grant you diffusion. That's a pretty strange <laughs> word. 
and and maybe we you know we really need that strange word because we're talking about something that we really don't have very good normal language for mm. but uh you know we didn't need a separate word for committed action uh why do we need some word out of nowhere like self as context mm. to describe the very thing that got the whole movement going yeah this aspect of our being that is very different than our mind with its thoughts and images memories whatever and our body with its bodily sensations and ability to move why not just use a word well that was the word originally used spirit yeah yeah i hope this answers your question um uh ulrika there's chris asking us where can we order your book now i had the pleasure yes. of you giving it to me at a conference but where can people find your book no one would publish it so it's published on amazon uh, i can uh, give a shout out to dj moran who helped me get it published on amazon and that's the place you can find it it does have a kindle edition which is a little cheaper and you can download that but that's where it is and so what and I, i know that amazon is a behemoth and some people would like to get things from somewhere else but that's my option so that's where it is <laughs> that's where we go to get it and so what i will do is i will find the link and we'll we'll find it together if i can't find well of sure we can find it there's, and there's then we'll put it in the comments on Amazon. There's so only you, one Hank Rob in the world. Amazon, <laughs> if you go to Amazon and put in Hank Rob for a book, that's the only one that will come that's, up. That's that's it. That's the guy. That's the guy. So I'll I'll find it uh, and I'll put uh, the link uh in the comments below so that people can can find that. Oh, Or all, and and also uh, go go to Amazon and find Hank Rob. So I want to ask you before we finish off What is way cool for you, Hank? What makes your heart sing? What what is your really this? It's one of the reasons I do it is because it's so cool. This is so much fun. <laughs> And as I said, I'm a fishing nut, so I like to be out in the world that doesn't care what I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know fish don't fish don't bite on the end of your line because how knowledgeable you are about fish <laughs> <laughs> they bite because you did things that work yeah yeah and uh you can't will them to bite and so uh, so connecting with other people and you know being here in this very moment with me with everybody watching and even people watching the replay like doing this teaching uh this and fishing and like if we could interview if we could gather a group of people um in the bar uh just before you arrive and i i go and i say to people like what like tell me about hang rob what would you want these people to say like if you if you could leave like an imprint in all of our hearts and spirits what would you want that to be about the hank rob you know you know um i find that uh a lot of people tell me that they are looking for peace but i'm not so much interested in peace as i am interested in joy <laughs> and if someone said to me encountering him help me pursue more joy in my life that's how i would feel well remembered yeah There's a phrase joyful participation in the sorrows of the world. Wow. We can't eliminate sorrow because in this world we often don't get what we want. We often do get what we don't want. That means sorrow. But we can participate joyfully
I don't ever want to leave this bar with you. Like, I think all of us. Yes, yes you do. You want to go dancing, which is not <laughs> about talk. <laughs> it's about doing something together that's not just talk. <laughs> that is that's, true. That's really fun. <laughs> we would go dancing. But I just want to say my experience right now is that I feel so connected with you and so moved by you and so honored and joyful uh, with you and I'm just so really really grateful that you shared this with us um and and I'm I know that you're not on Facebook and not not in this group but I just wanted to tell you that the comments here are going crazy with a lot of love uh, for you and um I I I don't know if you you are not on Facebook at all aren't you so you can't come in here and see them but I'll make some way to take I'll find a way to take screenshots of this and send it to you so that you can actually see the impact you've had uh, today on the people who are watching and they will continue to come in as, as people uh, watch the, the replay of this. So everybody who was with us, thank you so much for um, for for doing for being here i'm just got i just got distracted because i had one pe person ask asking if we're both going to cyprus are you coming to cyprus hank i have every intention of being there oh and me me as well so here's an, an official invitation to come up to hank and myself and have a drink or coffee whatever in the bar and then join us on the dance floor so that we can pursue whatever makes our hearts sing so that we can joyfully um, engage and be way cool <laughs> or do way cool together do what is that is what is way cool and let me say one more thing i know we're at the very end let It's me fine. thank all of the people who are here with english not as their first language I only have one, and it is your grace that gives me a chance to communicate with you because you have made the effort to uh, know the language, the only language I speak. So thank you for that opportunity. Well, thank you. Everybody, I hope you had a great time with myself and the amazing hand grub. I, I hope you now see what I have been talking about, this amazing human that you have such a great place in my heart Hank it's uh it's a joy to hang out with you and also as we spoke about I don't often have a lot of men in here I often spotlight women in and so I know that you were particularly proud <laughs> for me inviting you in here uh, and to come and speak some speak about something that you clearly are so passionate about and it's such a joy to see the way you impact others and how you how you made this very simple. Well, thank you. And I appreciate uh, this opportunity. And so the next time I see Russ, I'll just, well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I got Ross to be on Harris. <laughs> I was there as well. <laughs> All right, everybody, make sure to grab a copy of uh, Hank's book. And if you're coming to Cyprus, bring the book. And, uh, I, and you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll sign it. And if you don't want to sign it, I'll sign it for you. <laughs> <laughs> you you can you can find us well everywhere at the conference but really here's an invitation you know if you are coming to cyprus i am confident that hank and i will have an actual meetup in the bar please come and hang out with us and uh, uh, make this feel like a community that we're like a journey that we're all on together so everybody i'm going to ask hank to stay around and we're going to close the bar together and for the rest of you thank you so much for coming in here please keep sending the hearts whether you are here right now or watching the replay send the hearts and i'll make sure to forward all your love to the amazing hank Rob. So thank you everybody for joining us. Have a good have a good night or day or whatever it is for you right now. Bye guys.